Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sermon time, that's right. No more weights. Um, now, if that seems a little bit random, what, what, why is this bloke doing, like, really little weights just before a sermon. It'll, it'll all make sense um, as we go along. Well, I'd like to pray for us as we begin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just want to welcome your Holy Spirit. Fill me with the Holy Spirit as I seek to communicate this message. May your word flow through me. And Lord, fill each of us with your spirit as we listen. May your word be illuminated to our hearts and may we respond to it. So we commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel. We begin a series today on Daniel. The series is called Life in Exile. Now, you might be thinking, what, why are we doing Daniel? Uh, earlier in the year, I'd, I'd actually planned for us to do Daniel uh, at this time as we begin term two and spend some time in prayer and had a sense that we're ready. In fact, a few weeks back, I was having a, I, I went for a run with, with Colin Reynolds and he said to me, Kim, I think we're ready. We're ready to go deep. We're ready to go deep in the Bible. We've had this little period where everything's been disrupted. We're beginning to settle into our routines and we're ready to go deep into God's word. And a few others have said the same thing. I think the book of Daniel is a great book for us to read now. Maybe you've read it before. Maybe you've never read it. If you want to get the most out of this series, I want to encourage you to read Daniel at home. Uh, there's some amazing chapters. Some of it will be simple to understand. Some of it you might find confusing. You might want to write your own questions as you read Daniel for yourself. What are some of the underlying questions of Daniel? Well, I want to just begin with the book's opening. Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. So the story begins with exile. And if you were a Jew, one of your underlying questions might be, has God been defeated? You see, often people had a sense that their God was powerful if their people were victorious. But here, God's people had lost a battle. Um, in fact, not only had they lost, the, the temple had been ransacked by the Babylonians and they brought these special articles and they placed them in their own temple. The Jews might be thinking, where is God? Where is God in exile? Has God been defeated? Furthermore, um, there were a wave of refugees and a wave of people that were actually brought into Babylon, where we're going to see that King Nebuchadnezzar tries to um, assimilate them into Babylonian culture. And if you're a Jew in Babylon, you might be asking, well, how, how do I practice my faith here? I've got no temple. I've got, uh, I can't do my sacrifices. H how do you worship God in a foreign land? These are the kind of questions that you might be asking yourself at home. You see, we're used to going to church, but how do you worship God when you're at home? How do you worship God when you can't uh, meet with others in the same way that you normally would? Well, Daniel's got some things to say to us. But there's an even greater thing going on in the book of Daniel, and that's about God's response to the nations. We see in uh, the book of Daniel these very personal themes, and then these epic meta themes about about the nations and about world history and really about what God's going to do uh, with the kingdoms of the world and with his own kingdom and so we'll unpack that which again is rev relevant for us as we have this uh, global pandemic and we think about the nations of the world so the book of Daniel I want to suggest that um, there are two classic metaphors by which we can try and perceive what the Christian life's all about. One met metaphor is kind of, you could call it life in Israel or life in Jerusalem even. The other metaphor is life in Babylon. And if you're a Christian, as you approach how do you live as a Christian in the world, We've got a choice of which metaphor do we aim for? Are we aiming for life in Israel or life 
in Babylon. In many sense, um, senses the Christendom project, that was um, 1600 years where uh, the church and the state were kind of enmeshed. Christendom tried to recreate, in one sense, life and nations as Israel. And we saw a few strengths in that and, and lots of weaknesses. Today, we're seeing the collapse of Christendom. Um, Christians can't assume uh, that the society that we live in is going to go with Christian values. In fact, um, on the contrary, uh, we might experience pressure against Christian values and, and beliefs. And so we can understand this other metaphor of life in Babylon. And I want to suggest that if you're a Christian, life in Babylon is a brilliant way for perceiving how you follow Jesus in the world. And that will make sense more and more as we go through this series. Uh, the book of Daniel is connected with 1 Peter. I reckon Peter had been reading Daniel when he, when he wrote his letter. And when he wrote his letter to the churches, he, he addressed it to, to aliens and exiles. Christians who follow Jesus are citizens of heaven. And in many senses, we're aliens, we're refugees, we're exiles in the world. And so, as we open Daniel, as we begin, God has something to say to us as we seek to follow him. Let's dive in. From verse 3, we see an assimilation plan. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. So Nebuchadnezzar is not merely a tyrant who wants to overthrow other nations. He actually wants to build his empire by incorporating, kind of, um, in a worldly sense, the cream of the crop. Uh, he wants to assimilate, assimilate these uh, young men into Babylonian life. How's he going to do it? Uh, this official was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter into the king's service. So in many senses, uh, Amelia was right. Daniel and his three friends, who we're about to hear, uh, brought into Babylon, and they essentially... Uh, ushered into King's College. They get a scholarship from ne Nebuchadnezzar to be um, university students in Babylonian culture. They're to learn the language, the customs, the literature. Nebuchadnezzar is trying to turn them into Babylonians. And it's what nations do. I mean, even Australia, we've got our citizenship test. If you want to be a citizen of Australia, you've got to find out things about Australian culture. Um, like Donald Bradman's average and, and a whole bunch of different things like that. They were even given new names. Among those who were chosen from Judah uh, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. And the chief gave them new Babylonian names. To Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach and to Azariah Abednego. To rename someone is a powerful thing. Um, sometimes you'll have seen people that, that have a new name. Um, sometimes Chinese students might come to Australia and adopt a Western name as they settle into this um, context. I've got a friend um, who grew up uh, in Pakistan um, in a context uh, that was very anti the West. And when he became a Christian, he renamed himself. Uh, after one of the prophets. Even Jesus renames people. Uh, to to uh, Simon, he gives him the name Kephas or, or Peter. He calls him the rock. Or to uh, James and John, he calls them the sons of thunder. To Saul, on uh, the way to Damascus, God, Jesus gives him a new name. He, he calls him Paul. And so often... Um, even Jesus gives people a new name as they have a new identity in him. 
And so this powerful action of the king is trying to turn the Jews into Babylonians. And so therefore, they've got attention, haven't they? How are they going to be faithful to God in the midst of this assimilation program? I want to ask you a question. Uh, you see, Daniel begins with essentially some uni students. And some of you listen, listening today are going to be uni students. So I want to begin with you. But uh, this is relevant to children. This is relevant for parents. Um, the book of Daniel goes through many years. By the end of Daniel, he's going to be uh, um, significantly older. But for those in education, how are you going to remain faithful to Jesus in the midst of your education? I wonder what influences are part of an Australian education. You see, there are all kind of uh, underlying assumptions, even in a primary education. And what do we do with that? Now, say if you're at, at university, what particular ideas about the world are, are forming the way a university degree is, is presented? What's the um, kind of anthropology? You know, what is a, what's the assumption of what a human being is and what it means to live well in the world? Well, I think we need to unpack these things. And so the great tension is in Daniel is, are they going to resist the education? Or are they going to embrace the education? And for Christians today, we face this same question as we think about education and culture. You get some Christian groups that are afraid of the world and say, no, we're going to be separate. Uh, we're going to separate ourselves and we're going to give merely a Christian formation for people in education. On the flip side, you can see people that are just enmeshed with the world, that embrace everything there is about um, Western education, about a university degree. Well, Daniel and his three friends model what it is to do university in Babylon, which I think models what it is to do university in Tasmania. They get involved. They learn, they, they soak in, they, they, they make the most of their education opportunities. And you see by the end of it, they, they're going to flourish and shine in their learning. And yet, they seek to do so in a way that maintains their integrity, that maintains their faith. And to do so, they need to take a stand. So let's have a look at how Daniel takes a stand. Verse 8, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. He doesn't want to defile himself. Well, what does that mean? Most likely, um, there would have been worship practices associated with the royal meal. There was probably a, a lot of drinking and alcohol, um, but mixed in with that was the worship of these foreign gods. The meat uh, was probably offered to foreign gods, and there might have been um, eating practices, worship practices associated with the mealtime. And for Daniel, he's happy to receive an education, but for him to engage in that would have been to have crossed a line uh, and to be starting to participate in the worship of gods that he doesn't believe in. So he takes a stand. I wonder what stand you need to take in your life. Each of us have got different things, different pressures. I remember um, as a person Daniel's age, um, the pressure for conformity was generally around things like sex and alcohol, um, and fitting in. There was great peer pressure um, for people in uh, late teenagers or, or in, in your early 20s. Um, and yeah, just to seek to, to follow Jesus and to not um, join in for, for a guy was this macho culture. Um, to not join into that um, made you stand out and sometimes people would be critical or, or you know, give you a bit of a hard time. In the workplace, um, how you speak can tell a lot. I once worked in a factory where every second word began with, you know, the letter F. And just to speak normally, um, me and my brother working in this factory, we really stood out. We weren't trying to do it, we were just being normal. 
um, but we, we seemed very distinct to some of the factory workers. And we didn't want to, you know, judge these guys, we just, we just stood out. I remember a time when uh, people I was working with were um, basically lying on their timesheets and uh, me and my brother and, a, and another friend of ours, we received pressure from other workers to lie on our timesheets because if, you know, if we didn't lie, um, then there'd be a discrepancy uh, in terms of what happened in the day's work. You will face different pressures in life and at times you've got to take a stand. Well, so Daniel takes his stand, and God's behind it. Verse 9. Now God had caused the official to show favour and compassion to Daniel. But the official's scared. He says, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food, food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. See, one thing you learn with King Nebuchadnezzar, don't mess with him. If you mess with Nebuchadnezzar, you're in great danger. Um, he's, he, he's a tyrant. He's got um, vision for society, but yeah, you don't want to displease him. And we see that consistently as the story goes along. And it's true of, of, of world leaders uh, in many places today. So Daniel says, look, just give us a 10 day trial. Just let us test this out for 10 days. Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food. And then treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So the official agreed to do this and he tested them for 10 days. And what happens at the end of the story, at the end of the 10 days, uh, Daniel and his three friends look healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who'd eaten the royal food. So the guards took away their choice food and wine and they were to drink, uh, that, they, they were, that they were to drink and, and he gave them vegetables instead. And the outcome of it all after these three years is that just God blesses them. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of learning and literature. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And at the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. And what did Nebuchadnezzar see? The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered into the service of the king. Well, we see God's favour upon them. And so today in chapter one, I want to encourage you to seek to be faithful to God in this time of exile. Jesus had some words to say for us, and he actually prayed for us as we lived in the world. I want to read just a few of Jesus' words of prayer from John chapter 17. John chapter 17, verse 15. Yeah, this is his prayer for his disciples. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Jesus wants us to be in the world. He wants us to be in the workplace. He wants us to be at university. He wants us to be neighbours and companions with others. He wants us to engage in sport and, and different activities. He continues, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. He's saying, when you're with Jesus, you belong to heaven. We're, we don't belong to the world, just as Jesus doesn't belong to the world. And verse 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify, set them apart by the truth. Your word is truth. As you've sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And so Jesus' hope and prayer for us is that we be in the world, but not of it. And that we be formed and sanctified and made holy by truth. By the truth that is Jesus himself.
Today, I want to encourage you in your exile to pursue God and to pursue God's truth. There's a book um, that I've never read, but it's, I've heard several people talking about it in recent weeks. It's by John Piper, and it's got a quite harrowing title. The, the title is Don't Waste Your Cancer. What, what's meant by that? Um, clearly, the, this compelling title means that uh, even cancer or suffering can become an opportunity to receive some profound blessings and benefits to go deep with God. And in the same breath, I've heard people say several times, don't waste this time of a pandemic. What might that look like to not waste this? I mean, it means that we can see it as an actual opportunity. For me, um, one of the tensions is that tension between work and parenting. But this time is actually a beautiful opportunity for me to come alongside my children, to actually know my children even better, uh, to do life with them. And, and many people have said, you know, it can be hard as parents, and yet there's this beautiful opportunity to grow deeper in these relationships. And in the same way, for each of us, this is a time where we can go deeper with God. Are you going deeper with God through this pandemic? The temptation might be to be plugged in, to feed ourselves with inputs and movies and online communication. But the great opportunity for us is actually to take some real time with God. Some time of prayer, some time deepening your relationship with God. And so today, I want to encourage you to do a 10 day trial. What is the best practice, the best thing you can do over these next 10 days to cultivate your relationship with God? I'm trying to do a few weights, a few of these. Um, I was waking up with tension in my arms and um, by doing some weights, I'm trying to loosen um, the, the body and, and build up some strength. Do your exercise, do those things that will nourish your body, and even more, do those things that will nourish your spirit. So I'd like to pray for you as you live as a stranger and an exile in this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Daniel and his three friends. We thank you for the opening chapter of this book and how they've begun to show the way of what it is to be engaged in the world and yet faithful. Lord, Jesus has sent us into this world and he wants us to be faithful as aliens and strangers too. Lord God, in this time of pandemic, may we go deep into your word. We commit to you this whole series on Daniel and pray that you would teach us and guide us through it. And I want to pray for everyone in the community that you help us to invest in those practices which are going to nurture and nourish our faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name and we thank you that you are with us and that you can turn hardship into profound blessings. That's what you do, God, because you're majestic. So bless us as we seek to live as strangers in this world. Amen.